organizers uh, for um, this opportunity to speak. Uh, this is a joint talk, uh, as Shana said, with uh, Hugo, Hugo Tarlier. Um, it means that I'll give maybe the first half of the talk and Hugo give the second half. We very briefly toyed with the idea of literally speaking in parallel, but we decided it would be best to abandon that idea and go one after the other. Um, so I go first. Um, so Hugo and I have uh, been working together for about 10 years um, and what we want to do is to present to you our, our current project um, but it makes sense to go a little bit further back than that. So in fact I will talk um, mainly about the backstory if you will um, and then we'll get to the uh, current um, work which is the thing we really want to tell you about. Um, in the, the second half after a brief, brief transition between, between the two of us. However, let me begin with a kind of visual hook, if you want, for the, for the stuff that we really want to tell you about. So where we're heading is to two or three current projects, um, one of which is an um, installation for science centres called Exploratus, which you can see here. Uh, as I say, we're heading for this one. This is a visual hook. Uh, you can see there's some kind of screen, there's some other visitor station, and people apparently are doing something at this, uh, at this uh, station. So that's where one place we're heading. This uh, uh, <coughs> installation um, uses uh, certain puzzles which we've developed, which we have called Quadratus puzzles, which we've also packaged up into a uh, an app which can be downloaded, and that looks a little bit like this. So, as I say, this is where we're heading. However, it's worth going back uh, further than this um, to a previous project, um, which was a book called Mathema. Um, and one reason to talk about that is because it was um, very important for us in terms of putting in place certain principles and so on that we've adhered to um, ever since. So, <coughs> let me tell you a little bit about um, Mathema. I'm not going to explain anything about this slide, it's just to give you something to look at while, we, while I tell you a story. <laughs> um, although it is somehow in one image, a lot, this is, everything here is to do with our, our joint projects together. The, the task is to find the, which is not that difficult now that I see it and I'm very embarrassed by it, but the, I said we've worked together for about 10 years. Well, there's a, there's a much younger Hugo Parlier and Paul Turner <laughs> in this potpourri of images. Anyway, so about 10 years ago when, when we um, first uh, met, um, we were active in research, we were also teaching, and we instantly started having a lot of conversations, and one of the conversations we had was a kind of common lament uh, about the fact that most people, and this included people in our own entourage, and irrespective of level of education and so on, most people had no idea of what we as researchers actually do. And this was something that kind of we felt very, uh, very keenly. Um, but we also, there's another observation that we both observed, which was that perhaps it's true, as we've heard, as we know, that nine times out of ten, or maybe 19 times out of 20 even, when you tell someone you're a mathematician, you get a kind of bad negative response. You get the, I was terrible at maths, uh, I hate maths, all these things. We know that. However, what we both observed was that actually there is that one time out of 10, or maybe it's one time out of 20, where the person in front of you actually says, oh, I really liked maths at school. I guess that's not quite what, what you do. And what, what do you do? Tell me about it. And what we observed is that the community of researchers is actually pretty terrible at responding to that question. Yes. <laughs> 
I think I'm right with the, the reaction that you give. <laughs> um, so it varies between somehow polite not knowing what to say to some kind of misguided attempt to sort of downright arrogance. Um, so we thought, well, th these two situations are, it's not great to have this, both of these at the same time. At the one hand, on the one hand, we're saying, well, no one knows what we do. On the other hand, we're saying, well, actually, when we're confronted with someone who is interested, we don't know how to respond. So, of course, we looked around and um, at all the available resources, which, of course, includes everything that the outreach community is doing. It includes uh, books. Um, <clears throat> it includes public lectures, uh, maybe more targeted workshops, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and all these things are, are of course, excellent. Um, but obviously, any one of these things has its advantages and its disadvantages. For example, our part of our target audience, for better or for worse, was adults um, who uh, you know, may be otherwise engaged with kids or whatever else. So perhaps going out to some public lecture or something like this is actually a little bit hard. So maybe a book is better. Book also has an advantage that it's self-paced. However, of course, sometimes it's just easier to have some explanation when someone's talking to you. So whatever, whatever you look at, um, there, are, there are pluses, pluses and minuses. And um, Hugo and I kind of had, a, had this dream, I guess, that we could kind of cherry pick certain of the, the, the good features and package them up somehow in a way uh, that would um, produce something which was appropriate for the particular audience that we, that we had in mind. I, I think one of the things that we learned from yesterday's talks, which by the way were excellent, um, I think is that there's no general public in, in math outreach. It's so varied, and it's true that we had something in mind when we started, which is completely different from the sort of the general public. It really it makes a nonsense of the fact that when one writes some grant application, there's blah, blah, blah for the general public. I mean, what general public? <laughs> it doesn't exist. Anyway, so we had um, a certain uh, public in mind, and this was back in, let's say, 2012. And at that time, um, iPads, so tactile screens and so forth, were not that old. I can't remember when the first iPad came out. Was it maybe 2010? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yeah, around 2010. So this was only a little bit after that. So we had, a, had this dream that we could have a, a book which kind of came alive because it could talk to you at certain times, it could move at certain other times. A kind of Harry Potter book, as we thought of it at the time, where things sort of come alive. Um, <clears throat> So to cut a, a long uh, story short, um, we made such a book. That's this Mathema uh, book that I was telling you about. Let me, uh, so this talk really is not about um, Mathema, uh, but let me show you uh, this, uh, just to show you, partly to show you what we, what we did. Um, but also, it's by way of introducing something to you which will actually be useful a little bit. So. I heard someone whisper suspense. I agree entirely with that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, <clears throat> what do I want to show you with Mathema? I just want to rush through a few things. Um, let me uh, jump into, this is like the, the front page, if you want, the title page of Mathema. Let me actually just go through to where I want to be, which is uh, here. Very good. So in Mathema, can you see? It? Yes. So Mathema is, is a book. As I said, it's a book which is a little bit different. I have it here in front of me. I won't pick it up because, the, well, I will. There we go. This is Mathema. Um, so it's something that you can, it's a book, so you can read it at home in your favorite armchair and so on. Um, we have various chapters, very, we call them mathematical experiences. It doesn't really matter. There's some content to this book. Um, and one of the chapters is based on uh, these things that we call chroma squares. Now, a chroma square, um, 
of which you have an example here, is simply a grid, uh, an n by n grid of small squares, um, of which there are n colors and n squares out of the n squared squares are colored with each color. So this is an example of a, of a six by six chroma square. Uh, this is also an example of a six by six chroma square. This is an example of a five by five chroma square. <laughs> this is an example of a four by four chroma square. And I think you've got the idea. Um, however, just as a very, very, very brief aside, let me, tell, let me just draw attention to the fact that in this book, which I'm reading at the moment, um, if it, a paper book, you could print some examples, right? Here, I've, I've just got as many examples as I want. So this is a very minor thing, but one fact about the fact that this is encoded into, into this kind of setting is that it gives a, as many examples of these things as we want. Mm -hmm. So it is actually a small, a small advantage. Often in books, you give three examples, but it's not enough you want. Anyway, so we um, we have these we have these, these objects which are the, the, the basis of one of our chapters. Um, <clears throat> what we do with with these things? Um, so in French we call them chroma carré. In English they're chroma squares. Um, <clears throat> the first thing we do with these is we we try and puzzleify or gamify, if you want. I prefer the word puzzleify. Um, in the following way. So, I just went down a little bit in my book and now I opened an activity. So there's something to do in the book, you can interact with. So, how do we puzzleify these uh, chroma squares? Well, we invent some kind of reconfiguration puzzle, in some ways of a sort of standard type. There are lots of reconfiguration puzzles around. Um, but to do that, you have to introduce some kind of dynamics or movement, uh, if you want, uh, for uh, among the possible configurations that you might have once you fix the size <coughs> and you fix the colors. So the dynamical moves that we produce um, are, the, in some sense, the most obvious, which are that so you can swipe uh, rows uh, from, say, right to, to left. And uh, the effect of doing this is that each square moves along one position. So this light blue or almost green one here moves along to this position, this one moves here, and, and so on. If you do that, of course, this falls off the end, but you've revealed the square over here, so you just put it back there. So uh, this screen is not tactile, right? No, this one is um, So just pretend that I'm doing this now, and just watch, I'll do it like this to see. There. Yeah. Excellent. 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 <laughs> you, can, you can do the same thing with, with, with the columns. So if I, if I take this second column here, I can swipe it up or down. If I go up, and everything moves up one place, this one pops up the top, but I can put it back down there. I'm not going to try that trick again because it won't work as well. But you get the idea that I can move around um, by using these moves. And, and yes, so geometrically, actually, what's happening here uh, is that uh, the, the, the shape that we're living on is, well, this joins up with this, this joins up with this, and you're actually on a torus. Um, that's exactly right. So, Pac in fact, world. Sorry? the Pac-Man world. The Pac-Man Pac -Man world. This is normally what, how people better understand. <laughs> So what we do with this is we um, introduce the uh, goal, which is to you have to have some uh, pattern which you can perhaps remember, and you, you try and uh, take where you are and use those moves. For example, I saw that all the, all the pink ones were in the top row, so you try and a little bit like you solve a Rubik's cube, something like that. So this was how we uh, puzzleified uh, this uh, the situation. Okay, so um, where's, the, where's the, the, the math in this? Well, one, one thing that Charles has already raised. So, so instantly there's some kind of math in there because, yes, this is actually happening on a, 
are happening on a torus. There's another bit of math which is, the, which is where we are really headed with this. Excuse me for just scrolling through this. Um, and that is that um, every possible placement of, the, um, of, these, of these colors, if you take the, the, the three by three example, the nine squares and three colors, every possible placement of those uh, colors um, gives you a, config a possible configuration. And um, the, the notion of a, of a space of objects or space of configurations is, is a fundamental one in, in, in mathematics. So that was the object that actually we wanted to, cry and, uh, to, to, to use. So here um, you can see uh, some green dots. So these green dots, each green dot corresponds to a, a pot, one possible configuration. Mm -hmm. So this, at, at this point I can't, oh yes, and so this particular one right here you see is the, we've actually colored in for you and we've shown you that this is the one which is the sort of home, home pattern if you want. Mm -hmm. You'd like this, uh, it, the, one, could only, one can't really say it's a configuration space because space has some notion of metric or distance or something, nearness at least. Um, and here we don't have anything, we just have a splash of, of, of points. So if you want, at this stage, it's a kind of con configuration cloud. However, um, with these uh, configurations, there is a very, very natural notion of distance. Uh, and that is that if I take this configuration that you see here, and I, for example, scroll up the, 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 first, uh, the first column, if I had longer arms, I could do this. Um, if I scroll up the first column, there it is. Um, then I think we can all agree that this configuration is very close to this configuration <coughs> use one move. And the fact that I use the word close instantly takes us to the fact that we've got some kind of uh, metric properties of geometry. What also happened when I did that is that I, this green point here is the one that corresponds to the configuration we see now. I added this line between these two configurations to indicate that uh, they are joined by this single move. So in this way, you can uh, scroll around the, um, and this is from the, from the book, that all, all of this is in the schema. You can move around this cloud of points, and as you do so, are these white lines showing up? Yes, they are, very well. So you can, you can scroll around whoever you want, and as you do this, you, you add these lines, and the notion of, of, of distance is in, well, you have it sort of visually shown to you because if you can get somewhere within two, at least that tells you that the distance, maybe there's a shorter path, um, but uh, it gives you some notion of distance. And you build up a picture of this configuration space um, by adding in all these lines. Now, there are lots of these lines. There are about 10,000, so you're not going to do them all yourself, but you can have a good go. Um, and, of course, you can... You know, spin this around, you can zoom in. I don't know if this is working on the screen or not. Is that working yet, more or less? So you can, so you can kind of look and uh, if you wanted, you could try and zoom in on some point and, 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 and try and find out how many possible edges can come out. But then things like this. Sorry, yes. I'm lost. You're lost? Yes. Ah, okay, very good. So it's a well, 3D not very good, space. Sorry? It's a 3D space so in which okay, yeah, fair each enough. configuration you associated a 3D coordinate in the 3D space? So, so this is, a, this is a, 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 so to go a little bit deeper into, into the maths, this is a nine-dimensional space because mm -hmm. we are in some way representing in three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not telling you exactly how that kind of projection to three-dimensional space is working. All I'm saying is that each of these points corresponds to a configuration. And I represent the fact that two configurations are close by taking the two configurations, here's a point, here's another one, and I make, I draw a little line. So I add a graph, I, I, I make a graph in that way. So if, if, we had, if we had two talks, I would tell you more about this. In, in some sense, this was just to give you an indication of the objects and the kind of things that we have in there. So my apologies if I went too fast over it.
Yes. Why are close points not close? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so... The <laughs> because of the projection. Because of the projection, yes. So... <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we haven't heard these questions before. Yes. So this is, obvious, this is a good question, yes. So the answer to this is, well, you're projecting a nine-dimensional space onto a three-dimensional space, and in doing so, um, that's not so easy to do in a way where for every pair of close points, they're, they're actually represented closely there. Okay. That's the answer. And because our interest was to go to do some mathematics, but to not go too deeply in the mathematics, and also to rely on absolutely no background, some of the words I just said then, we weren't prepared to use. Okay? So, this question of how far we go in the explanation, well, it's exactly what I said before. We were just satisfied with the fact that we had these points and we were representing it this way. But this is, these, are, these are good questions. So, I guess one conclusion could come that actually the the puzzle graph or the configuration space is not completely represented right now. Like, you're not showing all the edges that are there, right? You're just showing the ones that you are doing a path in the moment. Exactly, exactly. I'm, here I'm only showing you the, um, the uh, so the ones I did. But, of course, if you want to see, see, yeah. see, see all of them, I mean, there's some kind of need to, to have that. Well, there you are. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. You, you kind of, once you've started playing around with it, there's a natural question. And it's fantastic that you asked that question because literally this is what's a few lines down in the book because there's this need to um, want to see what it looks like and it looks like this. And you can move it around. It's a little bit, the resolution doesn't look quite so well. Um, okay, so, and just um, one other aspect of this uh, is that I said that one of the things that we were bothered about with books, was that they couldn't talk to you. But of course, with, a, with something like an iPad, um, it can talk to you. And again, I stress that this was, a, was you know, maybe not 10 years ago now, but a, around that. Now, everything talks to you. Phones, there are videos everywhere. But really, this wasn't actually the case at, the, at that time. So the idea that you would have a video coming out of something or other, phones at that stage actually didn't, didn't do that. So. So just to say that, uh, so we have these videos which do something, although the, we appear not to have any sound. Uh, actually, there is some sound. I can hear it, but um, there is actually sound. It doesn't matter too much. Okay, so whatever happening, someone is telling you something. Okay. It's not really important for now what's, what, what, what was being said, but the point is that this voice does talk to you. It also actually stops. We want to maintain the, the self-paced aspect of, of videos. To break it up for you. You have to actively continue at a certain point. Okay, so uh, that perhaps is all I wanted to say about Mathema, just to give you an idea of it. Um, just come back to the other screen. And Okay. And so, what were these key elements that I was telling you about? What was, what was important to us in, in making this, uh, this book? So, the first thing is, was that we wanted to um, engage with authentic mathematics. Um, this was very important to us, or at least authentic mathematical processes, because that was the thing that we wanted to get across. Our aim, remember, was to explain somehow to the people who wanted to hear about this, what we did as researchers. So it was important to us that the mathematics was in some sense genuine. Another aspect was that um, we, uh, we say that do not compromise with design. Well, I think that's very important. Um, and uh, we did make a very big effort uh, for that. I think that especially perhaps an adult audience, 
sees when something's a little bit clunky and badly designed, and it does make a, it does make a difference. Uh, and also, um, an important point is that uh, to use the technology in a, in a genuine way, um, not in some kind of gimmick way. Um, and again, it's possible that now technology is used in a, in a genuine way, but it's very hard to use it in a genuine way. Um, there's a lot of, you still see a lot of things which you know, claim to be interactive, but it really doesn't go beyond the fact that there's some pop-up which might explain something, or some slider maybe to vary some parameter or something, and it's not very exciting. It takes more of an effort somehow to use the technology properly. Um, so those were our key, uh, our key elements. Um, <clears throat> so when we started out, uh, oh, what's the kind of wish list of ingredients? What do you need? You need time and expertise. You need funding. You need, if, you, if you're not going to program yourself, then you need some kind of development team who are good. And of course, you need a good publicity and communication strategy. So this talk, as I understood it, is not supposed to be just a kind of show and tell. Uh, with going into a little bit of difficulties. Well, it turns out that the difficulties are more or less what's written on that, on that list. So the difficulties are, well, finding the time and expertise. And it's really not trivial because maybe the person who can come up with ideas is not the same person who can actually write. If you're writing a book, you have to write or make videos or, or, or front up to the public or whatever it is. There's actually a whole, or read. Uh, we had a lot of fun, actually and difficulty finding people to read these scripts for the videos. Do you get a mathematician who's not a, who sounds unprofessional when they read, but they sound that they know, they know what they're talking about and that comes across? Or do you get an actor who doesn't have a clue what they're saying, but their enunciation, the way they're talking is better? All these are uh, problems. Attracting funding, it's an interesting one for us, um, of course, Making such a thing costs, costs a fortune. We were very lucky. Uh, we got funding from the uh, Swiss National Science Foundation via the GORA program. Some of you may know about that. Um, but also, we had some, we had an editor, Lausanne Tombooks was the name of the editor, a sort of Lausanne based startup, who also provided a lot of funding, maybe around a third, maybe of the total budget, I would say. Um, but it's interesting in the sense that it was a public-private partnership in that sense. It wasn't just public money that went into this, um, which also has certain, creates certain difficulties. Um, getting a talented development team, again, we were very lucky. Um, we had a great programmer. We didn't do the programming ourselves. Um, and then this last point, developing a publicity and communication strategy. This is the same, I think, for everything. I mean, it's the question of how do you get either people through the door if you're making a, for example, a science fair, um, or um, how do you get a readership? Um, how do you get your, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to stress you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm thinking the lassoing work. <laughs> um, but if you, if you have something, how do you get it out there? If you have a, an actual book, then it's, at least it's there and it's on a shelf. If you have a book which doesn't have any physical form, then in theory it can reach this huge audience worldwide, but in practice it's, 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 it's much harder than that. So these would be, I would say, the sort of the, the key um, four uh, points which, which uh, indicate um, uh, the difficulties. So <coughs> after Mathema, what did, what did we do? So this is now leading up to the, the current project. So using the, um, the, the material that we developed for, for Mathema, we gave, well in fact, in particular Hugo, um, we gave a lot of uh, workshops uh, based actually on these, on these chroma squares which I introduced to you. And through these workshops we got to see what works best. And one of the things that worked really well is precisely the, those chroma squares. Um, and what we found is that we 
you know, maybe Hugo would go into a school or talk to uh, any kind of audience, and afterwards, after having gone through the workshop, there were requests for more. There was the, well, where can we carry on playing these games? Where can we do these puzzles? And at that stage, we didn't have anything. So what we did was we uh, teamed up with two other people, uh, Mario Guterres and Elena Juarez, here they are. Um, and um, <coughs> they are both very uh, talented uh, programmers. Uh, they work very well uh, together as a team. And um, Mario was also the head programmer of the FEMA project, so he knew about this, this kind of thing. So they came on board and we, and we made this uh, umbrella uh, uh, project, if you want, called Quadratus, um, which uh, is based around what we call Quadratus puzzles, which I think were in the title of the talk. So Quadratus puzzles are essentially generalizations of the chroma squares that I told you about before. Um, generalizations in the following way. Now, you still take the order of squares, but not in, a, not in a square. You just take some number of squares. And uh, you can imagine still there are still sort of columns and, and, and rows. So, uh, however, we're going to generalize this so that, remember before, when you move the row, it would fall off and come straight back there. There's no reason that you have to cycle around there. So you can actually generalize the notion of, a, um, of this chroma square, not only by changing the shape of the board, but also by changing how you glue up the edges. So you're no longer on a torus, you're on some more complicated shape. So for example, if I take this first row and I scroll to the left, what is this indicating? Well, the square that falls off now joins up to there. So this was a kind of key idea of how to generalize uh, chroma squares. Of course, there is still the standard way of gluing things, just the next available one. Um, but we're in a more general setting. And of course, you still have, um, you still have to choose some number of colors and some number of colored squares and so forth. But the idea uh, remains uh, similar to chroma squares, but you're on a different shape of board, and perhaps you also have a, a little bit of a twist in how things are how things are joined up. So um, I guess I've already said this. So the dynamics is as for chroma squares, you can swipe up and down, and. As for the case of chroma squares, I showed you that big graph before, there's still a space of configurations. And in each case, you can represent that space. And here, just for interest, this is the graph. So these are all the pink points correspond to configurations, and the, the lines as before correspond to when you can get from one to the other via one move. But what's this the graph of? Rightly, this is actually this is again a three by three square, but this time I've just got two colors, one with three squares and the other with the remaining six. So it's small. And one of the good things about having this flexibility of these puzzles is that their configuration graphs, which at some level is well at least part of the mathematics lives, they are approachable. And moreover, um, we can illustrate them present them in a way which maybe does not represent the metric properties with actual distance, but it has some structure. Already the idea that a space of configurations has some structure, if you can get that far. You can see this is a, a symmetric picture. And you instantly get to questions such as, well, does this symmetry, if you look, I think from a distance, I think one sees kind of these three hubs here with some symmetry. Well. What are we seeing there? Does that correspond to something in the configurations? What does that correspond to? It's very easy uh, to get to actual uh, genuine maths questions. Um, so, these puzzles, these quadratus puzzles, excuse me, 
Um, we then uh, packaged up into, uh, as I say, this, this app, which you can download. So this gave somewhere to at least carry on um, uh, playing uh, puzzles. And this is where I'm going to transition to, to Hugo. Uh, this QR code is the QR code. If you click on it, it's the landing page for Quadratus if you want to download the Quadratus app. And I have to now say the thing which I dread saying, which is that the Android version is almost there. But this, at the moment, <laughs> works for, for iPhone. My sincere apologies for this, but literally we're like days away from having the Android version of this, of this app. So you can download this now um, if you want. And uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a, a, a change of technology here and a change of person. Uh, <laughs> we may want to get people to come up and actually try uh, some of these uh, puzzles. Should we just start with... Mm -hmm. Does somebody want to come up and try one of the puzzles for us while we set up? <laughs> okay, you can win because you're right there. Okay, whoops, sorry. The original configuration. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyways, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about more about the projects that sort of stemmed from the ideas of Quadratus and all of that, but before starting, I'd also like to thank the organizers. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and it's also wonderful to see such a varied and enthusiastic set of outreachers, and it, uh, I think it's good for the soul, it's good for the heart. Um, as you see here, uh, so maybe we can switch to the full thing, so this is source, is this right? So, um, as Paul said, this, I organized lots of workshops. Uh, this is this is if you see at the upper left corner, this is a research stage we did in Luxembourg in 2018. And of course, the person you see on the left there, you all know who he is, right? Because he's very famous. Does anybody know who that is? Yeah, on the left. So Paul does. Does anybody else know? The Grand Duke of Luxembourg. Were you very close? The Prime Minister. Who played a who played a Chroma Square puzzle many years ago, and who was uh, who came up to me, and you'll never guess what he said when he came up to me. He said, 
I was horrible at math at school. <laughs> <laughs> and don't make me look stupid. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Anyways, he managed to do the quadratus puzzle, so I suspect he wasn't as bad as he thought he was. Anyways, and so these projects uh, ended up being many different things. Um, here are some glimpses of some of the things I'm going to talk to you about. Um, you, what you see here is the Luxembourg Pavilion at the last expo in Dubai, which was shaped in the form of a Moibis band. When I found out, I thought that we have to get, have, find some way to get on that pavilion because there's no way that this is going to happen twice in a lifetime that this is going to be a Moebus band pavilion. Anyway, so we managed to get on the pavilion. And uh, here are some pictures from that. And let me tell you a little bit more about, uh, about, these, uh, about these puzzle graphs. So, so what Paul was saying, was hinting at, is that they have these puzzle spaces, these puzzle graphs for these square tile translation surfaces. And um, I just want to say one thing about these graphs. So I'm going to show you some more examples of these graphs that you see here, uh, the different shapes and forms that Paul was talking about. These can become manageable. Um, uh, one of the questions, of course, from the audience before was whether or not the, the metric properties of the graphs are represented in these drawings. And that's, of course, an excellent question. But it's also, a, I mean, it's a, it's a we don't know. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a very deep question into what the metric properties of these graphs really are as you get these graphs to become larger and larger. And this is related to expansion properties of the graphs and things like that. So there's many things we just don't, simply don't know about these graphs. So it's, it's, not, it's not an easy question to answer in, in, in any way or form. But one thing I do want to point out, something that is very easy to answer, is just to say that these graphs, even though some of the smaller ones, we can visualize them, in general, of course, this becomes difficult. And that's because these graphs tend to be quite large. Um, for instance, the, when I was talking with this, uh, this science museum in Luxembourg, the Luxembourg Science Center, they said, they said to me, you know, um, I showed him the, the graph that we had in, in Mathema, and he said, well, why can't we do you know, these other graphs? And I told him about some of these puzzles we were developing. He said, you know, he said well, we, we need quite a big screen if we wanted to show that in Luxembourg. And, and he said, oh, oh, oh you know, we're in Luxembourg. You know, sort of, <laughs> we can say, well, how, how big would the screen have to be? I said, well, you know, the, the thing is that the size of the graph is 3 times 10 to the power of 12. So if you, if you use every vertex, you ask that it be one square millimeter, the size of the screen would have to be Luxembourg. <laughs> so he said, oh, yeah, well, we can't do that. I said, no, that's probably true. We can't do that. So, OK, so that was, that was fair enough. And then, and of course, if you, once you complexify the puzzle a little bit here, you, you, know, you just, I didn't do some, that much. I just added a few squares here and there. I added four squares for every square. So what's the size of the graph? Well, it's 10 to the power of 80. Which, which, I mean, I have no idea what that number means, right? But I do know that it's bigger than Luxembourg. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these graphs become complicated. And of course, you, so you can't visualize them in their totality, but you still want to explore them. Because as a human, when you're actually, you can actually play with this puzzle. You can actually do it. But as a human, you, you, you can't, of course, go through all the configurations. But you can, you can try to. And this, was the, uh, this is the idea of these. Uh, of these exploitus graphs that I will, I think, demo later. Um, OK, just a word about this. And this is something that Paul said at the beginning. And this is something we care deeply about, is that behind these, behind these puzzles and behind the, 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 the ideas that we had for these puzzles, we're trying to convey some sense of what research math is about. And what's wonderful about these puzzles is that you can, you can give them to a three-year-old who you know, doesn't know anything about topology. This, you know, this is fault of the school programs. We don't teach them anything. So three-year-olds know nothing about topology, and yet they can play with the puzzles, right? But then you can you can look at these puzzles and and um, and, and you can look at them, and you can sort of look what's behind them. And there's lots of interesting math objects, and there's lots of interesting research questions. So the of course the idea of these puzzles, what Paul didn't say, is that these puzzles are related to or the idea of these puzzles is related to things like uh, called Teichmuller theory and that type of thing, and just research topics. And, and of course, one glimpse of this is the, the picture we saw before was that you know, here we have with the surface that you're playing on, even if you don't know it, I mean, you're just playing a puzzle, the surface that you're playing on in the first case is a torus, whereas in the second case, 
already, you're on a, a, a topological surface of genus two. And, and these things become more and more complicated. I, I'm not gonna get into all of the research questions that this conveyed, but I do wanna say that when we started doing this outreach project, the immediate thing that happened to us is we ended up looking at objects that we had to do research about ourselves. So we immediately got into research questions by trying to convey what it is that we were doing to the general public, and that was really fascinating for us. So there was a, and we're st still, we're still doing research on these quadratus puzzles because there's many things we don't know. But here's something we finally figured out, and this took us years to figure out, is that if you, took, if you take a very big chroma square and you color it anyway, we roughly know how many moves it takes to get from one configuration to the other. And the solution is really cool, and we're, anyways, we still have to write this up, huh, Paul? <laughs> so, this, um, <clears throat> anyways, but this is this, uh, both for me and for him. It's not a specific, it's not that one. It wasn't a directed graph, okay. Um, and there's lots of questions, and in general, we just don't know how to solve these puzzles. I mean, we have these puzzles, but we don't have any algorithm to solve them. Uh, I don't know what type of algorithm there would be, and so there's real genuine research questions and many of these things, I suspect, are related to, to things in topology um, and in the study of, of squared triad translation surfaces. So, you know, work of Alex Eskin and, and Muzikani and Okunkov and lots of other people and famous mathematicians like Samuel Lelier, who's here. I always put somebody in the first row of a talk. <laughs> I put their name just to move. This is a standard trick. <laughs> um, okay. The other thing that we, was really cool is that we were able to, to show these puzzles in many, many locations, and many people have, have played these puzzles. And here's an example of one of the puzzles that you'll be able to explore. Um, and this family stayed at, this was at the Science Festival in December, um, where in Luxembourg City at the, uh, uh, at the, Abbey, the Abbey de Nunminster. So it's in the, it's a beautiful location for a science festival. It takes place every two years in Luxembourg City. And uh, there's many, many visitors, and it's great. We always have a jam-packed room full of people trying to get in to, uh, to, the, to the math area. And this is one of the math areas that we created. And this family stayed there for two hours trying to figure out one particular puzzle and they managed to solve the puzzle in less moves than we can. And because we didn't, we didn't know what the minimum number of moves is. The graph is too big to compute it. And they spent two hours. And she finally solved it in six moves where I could only do seven. And I told them, I suspect one could do better than seven, but I'm not sure. And they said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> this puzzle here, I can show some of you who are interested, is a puzzle, I cannot make head or tail of it. I can't, I can't solve one of the lines in one of these puzzles to save my life, okay? And she spent about two hours working on this puzzle, and what I wanna show you is that she came really close to solving it. All she had to do was be able to invert these two squares. And I said, it's amazing, I, I have no idea how you did this, how did you do it? And she said, you know, I'm really quite far from solving the puzzle. I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah. So she understood the structure of the puzzle in a way that, that was, I mean, I don't know. She understood something that I, 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 I don't know what it was, but she clearly understood something that we didn't understand about this puzzle. <laughs> I'll show you the puzzle later for those who are interested. It looks like an easy one. It's not. Okay, so <laughs> that much, that much, that much I'm sure. And it was really interesting, yeah. yeah just to say, it's, it's an example where the gluing of the rows and so forth is non-standard. That's, non -standard. What, makes it, that's what makes it, that's what makes it. Yeah, that's clear. We have lots of these puzzles that, okay. Yeah, that's the other thing. I think we, I mean, I think it's pretty standard to come up with puzzles that nobody can do. Um, I mean, like no human can do. I don't think it's that difficult to come up with puzzles like that. It's more difficult to come up with puzzles that people can do. And this is, this is an interesting thing because, of course, if you're at a science festival, you have about you know, 10 seconds of people's time so that they come in. And if they come in saying, I hate math, and then they do a puzzle and they can't do it and they leave and they say, I hate math even more, then that's, that's, that's a lose-lose situation. Right? So you have to make sure that you, you, you give them activities. You don't, our goal for these activities and the beauty of it is that you have 
you know, three seconds of explanation maximum, and not even, maybe zero seconds of explanation, people sort of figure out what it is they have to do, and from that, they can immediately start playing, doing an activity, and then afterwards, um, they can possibly get into other questions, or at least you can, you can set a sequence of puzzles so that they start off by doing them, they gain confidence, and then they can get into a mood where they're, they're happy to try some of the more difficult puzzles. And this really, really works well. When yeah. you say humans can do or can't, it's because yeah. true impossibility of solving the puzzle? No, no, it's, just, it's just too hard. It's just too hard. I mean, you have to be able to see, when you, when you start doing the, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, this, maybe somebody will come up with some clever algorithm. To, to, for instance, if, if I take, just as an example, if I took 300 squares like this, okay, or, just, or something even reasonable, let's say 40 squares like this, and I pasted them together randomly, as a human, it's extremely difficult to see if there's any structure in here whatsoever. Yes. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of an extreme example, but I think some of the puzzles that we've created, I don't know if humans can solve. Yeah? Just, just to add to that, but they are all, in principle, solvable. Mm -hmm. Because, in fact, the first step is a genuine shuffle of the puzzle. In fact, one way of finding out how to do the puzzle is to sort of take a video of the shuffling and then undo un the <laughs> So they are all solvable. So it Which is incidentally not, lots of people do, yeah. So it is not that, that this is in a different component than the one you are no, asking. No, 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 Okay, so anyways, very briefly, uh, this is, these are images from the, uh, the station that we inaugurated at the Science Center last year, uh, roughly a year ago, um, uh, where people can come up and play the puzzle, and then I'll, have, I'll demo this at the end, and this will also be demoed on Saturday, the Exploratus puzzles, where there's different modes. Uh, people can play by themselves, but they can also play, they can also do a race against somebody else, and they can do a collaborative game where the goal is not to, uh, is not to defeat the other person, um, but the goal is to, to actually reach some configuration, any configuration that they have in common. So they have to communicate and they have to say, okay, okay, let's meet at this point, let's meet at the place where all the you know, white squares on the left or all the blue squares on the right or something like that. And that's, uh, anyways. Um, these are, as I said, we managed to get on to the, uh, to the Luxembourg Pavilion in Dubai. This was Unbelievably exciting and stressful because we had to organize all of this from abroad and we had, and they were nervous because they were saying, you know, okay, we have thousands of visitors every day. Are they going to be, you know, you have to, you know, you're going to show them math? <laughs> you know, is this, is this actually going to work? And so we did a variety of things. What you see here is, um, so you see that the, this is a, basically a, the, 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 the quadratus, exploratus station, but we also see they've also played physical games uh, that we created together with my colleague Bruno Deux. Here's an example of, of one of them. So these are, anyways, I can show you them afterwards. They're, they're digital games, but played by hand. Um, no, no screen required. Um, yeah, here's, here's, more, here's more pictures of this. Uh, and it worked really well. We had over, well over a thousand visitors a day. I mean, active visitors, that's the people we could actually track playing the games. Uh, and, and so the uh, pavilion very nicely asked us to come back. Here, here's another uh, activity that we do on a yearly basis, which is the Girls Exploring Math activity <coughs> in Luxembourg. Uh, just two words about that. We use the quadratus puzzles uh, for this activity as well. It takes place every year. We have about somewhere between 100 and 200. We don't actually do any publicity for this, but we have somewhere between 100 and 200 girls who come up and, and sign up for this every year. Um, we have to limit the numbers because we don't have that many spots. We're thinking of eventually doubling the number of spots. And we do different things. They, they, Anne Kiefer is on the upper left. She, she does a sort of a stand-up math show, which is lots of fun. Um, there's, uh, we also had a, um, a theater troupe coming from Paris who would do a, a play about uh, stereotypes and uh, confronting stereotypes, and then we have them play lots of puzzles and games and try to view math in sort of a different light. Um, 
It's something we care about a lot. Uh, Paul didn't mention this, but one of the beginnings of the story was, was creating activities for, for women in science when we were in Fribourg together. That was one of the original things. And so the expo asked us to come back. They said, we weren't, to be honest, I mean, the, the directors, <laughs> to be honest, I wasn't expecting people to get so excited about math. <laughs> we have this gap in uh, February, March. Do you want to come back? And uh, we said, sure, we'll come back. And then complete panic because we had to find the funds, we had to find the money, we had to find the project. And also, they wanted us to do something to do with, okay, we have this other project. I'm just going to briefly show you something about it. This is a project that we did together with Bruno Teu, which is the reshape project, which is very different, where people, they, on iPads, I don't know if you can see, but yeah, I guess you can see pretty well. People can come up, and we, we crowdsourced many, many drawings. So this girl is, is doing a drawing. And, um, and so we invite people to come up and do drawings, and we gather all of these drawings. I can show you that after a while. And then after a while, Boom, the drawing colors. <laughs> and, um, and the way that the, the colors come in have to do with, uh, I mean, there's a mathematical rule for how the colors come in using the winding number. Anyways, that was fun. So we gathered about 20,000 drawings when we were in Dubai. And um, so that was lots of fun. And at the same time, we wanted to uh, do puzzles again, but in a different light. And so this is when we came up with the idea with, yeah, which numbers? You said that has to do with uh, uh, numbers. The, the winding numbers. Winding, winding numbers. numbers. It's um, I, I can, but it's it's a there's a topological rule for how you how you associate a color to each zone. Okay, okay which is which is quite natural. Which has to do with the number of times you wind around a zone, basically. Um, and so we wanted to come up with something because it was related to this other art project that we were presenting. We wanted to come up with something that was a little bit different, and this is when we came up with the idea of doing retrace. And this is the second time in Expo. So let me, let me just demo this for you quickly. <coughs> All right. How do I demo this in the right order? <laughs> I have an iPad. It's here. Awesome. OK. So let me see. Where does this come in? What is this? So, um, roughly speaking, what we wanted people to do was to look at these graphs, and instead of trying to just solve them, we wanted them to, here we go, we wanted them to play around with the graphs, and let me just show you quickly. So. You have a puzzle like this one, okay? And what you see here on the left is the actual graph. And what people could do is they could choose a color and they could come around and they can try to color the graph any way they wanted, right? So this is the, this is the basic idea. And, and what, um, what would happen, and while I do this, I'm gonna switch this here and hope that this works. Oh, now I have to use my, I can barely see this. It's there. It's there, except for it's very small, I imagine, right? Mm -hmm. Right, there we go. And so if you, if you have this graph here, you can, you can sort of do it by hand. But if you have a more complicated graph, such as, uh, bum, 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 retrace, small, this might be it. No, that's not it. Whoops, sorry. Uh, Exploratus bridges, Exploratus player one, retrace light background, here we go, retrace player one. If you, have, if you have a puzzle like this, then the graph becomes actually quite large. And what you see here on the left, which you barely can see, right, is the graph of this particular puzzle. So as an individual, it's very difficult to come up and, and, and color, color this puzzle. I mean, it would take really a long time. But as a crowd, this can be done. And and of course, I can. So let me show you the result of, of this. Is this is uh, there we go. This is sort of the result of of uh, seven days at the expo. Let me press this button so you can you can read, you can visualize it. And what's kind of interesting here.
here is that if you look at this carefully, at one point you're going to see some of the squares are actually black, and the black squares correspond to places that nobody has ever gone. So people were here for seven days. We had, I don't know, somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 moves that had been made on this graph, but there's certain configurations that nobody actually ever reached. And let me see if I can, hold on, if I can find one for you. Ah, oh, there's one. I don't know if you see it, but there's a black square there. I think there's about six of them that nobody's ever reached. Okay. Anyways, okay. Uh, with that in mind, I think I'm going to roughly wrap things up. Let me just put this back in. Make sure I haven't forgotten anything. All right, so this, we're not seen anywhere, or are we? No, we're not. What am I? Oh, yes, we are. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, and these are just some of the people that, uh, that, that uh, have been supporting us over the years, some of the institutions, we're very grateful for all this support. I think even more than the institutions, or equally as well, we're super grateful for all the people that helped volunteer on all of these stands, uh, and that helped us animate all of these things, because as much as, as one of the things we really learned from this experience is as much as creating uh, technological uh, activity that people can do, uh, getting people to actually do something really requires scientific mediation and people, people are key in this whole story and getting people to come in uh, and help <coughs> them gather, uh, you know, anyways, the, 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 the people person in this equation is, is more than essential and that's why the world needs more outreachers and thank you very much for your time. So, so the, it's open. Uh, it's an open question if uh, these kind of graph are connected or not. Uh, in fact, well, it's it's. It, no, I mean, it's it's clearly they're clearly not connected in general. Okay. Uh, for some of the graphs, we know they are connected. In general, we don't know. And for instance, counting the number of connected components, um, I think it has to do with. Um, yeah, I think it has to do with. But I'm but I'm not sure. We don't know. But I, mean, I think it has to do with. Uh, questions about moduli spaces and the connectedness of certain moduli spaces and uh, the placement of, yeah. I, I, I just, I, we simply don't know the answer, but we've observed that even in the, uh, I think Paul, you did the computation for the three by three with, uh, with yeah, non-standard gluing. Exactly, and, three and I completely, completely split up. It's a, it's a three by three here with some non-standard gluing. Uh, in fact, the, uh, one of the things that we did in Mathema was with precisely with the original three by three Kramer squares, we proved that that is connected. That was one of the kind of genuine bits of math that we did. But in general, uh, we don't know. And uh, yeah, it's a good example of somewhere where you just instantly get at some <laughs> kind of research level problem. Actually, yeah. the Kramer squares example that Paul talked about in the end, they're connected for any coloring, provided that you have at least two squares of the same color. And if the number is even on one of the sides, then it's connected. Um, right, so as the front people in the audience, as long as the other side has at least length two. So, but I mean, so under a mild condition, besides an obvious case, that they're connected uh, if it's even. And otherwise, if it's odd, there's exactly two connected components, but only if you to choose exactly n squared colors. But the other cases, we simply don't know. Uh, yeah, first of all, um, thank you very much. And um, this uh, question about connected graphs, um, you can find also downstairs. I brought the Ostomarton from Archimedes, and it was studied in the last 10 years or well, 15 years probably. And in that case, the graph uh, has 266 connected configurations and two unconnected, so two that are connected between them but disconnected from the rest. You can find that in the paper uh, downstairs. Uh, my question on your talk is, uh, I think it's a great way 
for outreach um, in the sense of gamifying and having people uh, interacting with puzzles, etc. And I can really uh, easily understand that people ask you to come back, etc. Uh, if I got, if I come back to um, your original uh, question of Mahima, uh, was how can we better explain our research? And it's not easy to me to understand how this answers the original question. If I understood correctly, maybe I didn't understand. So, so I think the, so the one way to, to, to say this is that, so that Mathema was the thing that was trying to answer our original question. And then our objective changed oh, okay. in some sense. So I think that one thing is Mathema originally was conceived for an adult reader. And as we did workshops and as you know, kids came along to the various the nuit de séance, things like this, as we saw the ages get younger and younger, well, our thinking also got, well, actually, <laughs> these people seem to be liking these puzzles. So um, now with uh, Exploratus, it can be taken at a whole lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. And it can also be used at a whole lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have people uh, or an audience, the target audience, who want to genuinely learn more about the mathematics, if that's appropriate, the mathematics is there to be talked about, and you can get into it by playing the puzzle. And there was, there was a period where we had a sort of a, a, a preliminary version just of the puzzles, which we used in workshops and so on, and that worked well. But now, um, it's, I think, much more, much more open. And it is true that I think that the, the fact that kids uh, really engaged with these puzzles is is, a, is something that we just observed and in some sense we directed where we were going <laughs> towards what we were going <coughs> to That's a fantastic thing to see you know, these, these, some of these pictures of kids. Using. I don't know if you have anything yeah, to add. Yeah, yeah, I'd add that in fact when people are doing these puzzles and are doing some of the more difficult puzzles and the thing is that, I mean, in particular I've noticed that the this is not on purpose but the best people at doing these puzzles tend to be 12 to 15 year old girls. Okay, I mean, this is just, I have no idea why, but they're, and, I mean, there's lots of people who get engaged in the puzzles at all ages. I mean, there was a grandmother on the, the Dubai thing that they literally had to drag her off the, <laughs> off, off the, 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 the thing. So I mean, it's not, it's really, it's definitely universal. One of the things we noticed, and this was surprising to us, is that, in fact, originally, I mean, if you, you go to a science festival, you have a targeted audience already. If you go to, of course, to an open day to university or that the, art, the audience is already targeted. If you're on the pavilion in Dubai, you have also a targeted audience, but a very different targeted audience. And it works more or less universally. As long as you make sure that the puzzles and the activities are broken down into such simple steps that anybody can start with them and start to enjoy them, it really works for anybody. And almost anybody, meaning you know, maybe 95% of, of the population or whatever. So this is, there's, an, there's certain activities that you can really use for them. In the, in the real general audience sense. But as Paul says, the level of understanding and how far you're going to go really depends on the individuals and how far they're willing to go and how far you're willing to give time to help them go to that and whatever. But the thing is that like these activities where I was showing you that these people were exploring these puzzles in ways that we haven't done before, I mean, arguably they are. They're, not only are, they, are you telling them what research is, they're actually doing it. I mean, they're, they're, they're actively doing, they're going, where no one has ever gone before in, in, a, in a mathematical puzzle. So I think they're getting, of course it's not, you can't replace you know, <laughs> education plus the whole, the joys of research and whatever in an hour. There's no way. But to get a glimpse of that, I think this does give you some sort of fast track to the frontier of knowledge in, in some sense. You can sort of say, you know, you get them to the point where, where they can say, oh, I don't know how to solve this. You're like, well, it turns out I don't either. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So if I solve this, then I'll know more about this puzzle than you. And I said, absolutely. And this gets them really excited. And it's true. It's absolutely true. It's genuine. Um, yeah, I was wondering. How did you find the people who did the programming, like your personal experience and maybe some general advice if we want to start similar projects but we are looking for this kind of specific expertise? Yeah, because I, mean, I, so I can maybe I can answer that because I've gone through this 
thing re recently with the, with the curve grinds and we had to find other people who were not Mario. I mean, Mario, as Paul pointed out, was our lead programmer on Mathema, who was through our contact with, uh, with Tom Books, was the person who was attributed to our project. And it turned out he's an incredibly talented and, uh, and, uh, and, and great programmer. So we got lucky with Mathema. And then we got lucky afterwards that he got excited about the project and was willing to invest his personal time into this. So we got lucky twice. Um, but for the other projects that I've been working on which require programming, we just asked for offers, different companies. The one thing that we had one really bad experience uh, with programmers where we basically had to abandon everything that they had done and we had to switch programmers. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that one of the problems was they were in Mexico, so Mario knew them and thought that he could you know, coach them abroad and it wasn't possible. And, the, uh, and, and so anyway, so then we found a solution for that. But then the other programs we had for this other pro uh, project were local in Luxembourg, and we could talk to them, and we could meet them, and we could convey our experience. And this is super helpful if you're able to meet them in person, or you know, and talk to them, and actually convey what it is that you want. That's the only piece of advice I, I have: is that outsourcing programming is certainly cheaper if you go to other countries and that type of thing, but you you don't have the same personal relationship with, with the people. Probably more expensive. There's also there's no real solution to the fact that it's <laughs> fine, but that costs money, of course. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, uh, have, have you considered where uh, uh, the AI Institute in Leipzig, where starting to consider using agents to to, to, to train them to solve uh, this kind of. Of, uh, like sliding puzzles or related puzzles. Uh, have you tried that? So what exactly have we tried? A a uh, to train agents, like to train virtual agents to explore oh. the, the configuration no, spaces. No, 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 we haven't, yeah, that's, no. that's, that's, that's a good question, yeah. Perhaps we could talk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, it is not an outreach question, <laughs> it's a curiosity. I don't know if it makes sense. I was curious uh, when I, the first reaction when I saw this class. If it makes sense to pose the inverse problem, I mean, you have a graph, maybe a graph with, uh, with some uh, properties, mm -hmm. yeah. and you look for a, a puzzle which has that graph. Very good question. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I, I saw your graphs, I, I thought uh, the images of uh, um, the polytope, four dimensional polytopes. Uh, star polytopes, which are terribly complicated graphs. Yeah. And I was wondering, it would be that's, funny if we uh, had a good puzzle question. with that. That's a very, very good question, because one of the, one of the uh, origins of the, of the project itself was uh, to do with uh, the flip graphs. Uh, this was one of our original ideas. And flip graphs, I mean, so you're talking about polytopes, you have flip graphs of polygons. Mm -hmm. That's related to a lot of research questions that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. And there's all these rigidity questions for these things, which basically says if you see the graph, can you see what, what, the, what the polygon it was that you were flipping on? And so th that, that exact question is on my to-do list or give to a student. How, much, how rigid are these things exactly? Very good question. We'll postpone the rest of questions to the coffee break. So let's thanks for letting go again.